Welcome to Concerned Citizens Presents. Concerned Citizens of Laguna Woods is an organization dedicated to peace, economic and social justice, good government, and a clean environment. Every month, we invite an expert to enlighten us on a topic related to our mission. Because Village TV videotapes these presentations, we can share that expertise with a larger audience. We hope you enjoy today's broadcast. Uh, our speaker tonight is wonderful Catherine Partey. Catherine is a, uh, a lead auditor uh, and a quality assurance engineer for General Atomics. I learned tonight at dinner about General Atomics, a very interesting company down in San Diego, uh, actually in La Jolla. Uh, and she's been at that company for 43 years. For a good portion of her time at General Atomics, Catherine was involved in decontamination and decommissioning of nuclear facilities, which included the disposal of nuclear waste. She was responsible for sending nuclear waste for disposal at several facilities around the whole country. Catherine holds a master's degree in computer information systems she is the chair of the Southern California section of the American Nuclear Society and a certified quality engineer in the American Society of Quality. Lest you think that Catherine only deals with nuclear energy, think not. Catherine also plays bluegrass gospel on the fiddle <laughs> and loves driving sports cars. <laughs> Please put your hands together for the first Concerned Citizen Speaker of the Year, Catherine Partey. So we're going to talk a little bit about fusion first. Fusion versus fission. Fusion is also called thermonuclear fusion, and that's when we take four hydrogen atoms, smash them together, and make helium, and that releases a lot of energy, a lot of heat. It's called exothermic. Fission is the opposite. It's where we take radioactive atoms, which is G235, the fizzle, and we split the atom. We put a neutron down the middle of it and split it, and it also releases a great deal of heat. So those are the two sources of heat we're looking for, and what do we do with the heat? Boil water. Boil water, exactly. And what does the water do? Make steam and turns the turbine. turbine. There you go. So it doesn't, it doesn't matter, it's all, it's, whatever the source of the heat does, we still have to make the electricity, right? Because that's what we want. Okay, so th this is some interesting facts about the sun. Most of which none of you really care about, except for it takes eight minutes for the light to get here. That's what we care about. And what we also care about is how dense it is and how hot it is, because those are the things that drive fusion and let it occur spontaneously. Now the sun is made up of about 75% hydrogen and 25% helium, and the core is where all this takes place, where the fusion is happening, where it makes, takes the hydrogen and fuses it together to make the helium. Because of the great pressure and the temperature, you don't really have to do anything to force it. It's not like on Earth where we force it. It's spontaneous, and hence we have all this heat that comes down. We're 93 million miles away, but yet when it gets 110 in the desert, are we comfortable? Not really. It's a good thing it's that far away. So this is the talks about the mass of the atoms, and the reason I put it in here is because what is left over after these atoms combine is the from the original mass is what's converted into energy. And we all know this wonderful formula by Einstein equals mc squared. These are the numbers that go into that, the, the uh, mass of the helium or the hydrogen, the uh, light speed through the light, that um, 3 times 10 to the 8th meters per second squared, and the energy that comes out in joules. Now, this, for just 4 grams of, of hydrogen, this shows that this is enough power to light a 60 watt light bulb for over 100 years. Great, it's promising, right? I mean, it's really promising, but we're at least two decades away, maybe more. And for a long time, fusion was always 40 years away. So we're getting closer, however. Now, on Earth, we take deuterium and tritium, 
and we combine those, but it has some drawbacks. It takes a lot of energy to force this because we're not the sun. We don't have an unlimited amount of temperature and pressure to force this. To cool things down, we have to use helium. Helium is a very scarce commodity as time goes forward here. There's less and less helium on the Earth. So one of the things that's the promise of fusion is it makes helium. How are we going to capture that helium? Do we know yet? Mm, not so much yet. It's another issue we have. So the reaction stability, uh, has, sustainability has not really taken place until a couple weeks ago we had a report out of uh, Lawrence Livermore that they actually produced more energy with the fusion reaction than it actually took to make it. Now, very small, very incremental. Is it still promising? Are we still happy? Oh yeah, oh yeah. <laughs> we're, we're very happy because there's more R&D than we thought. And it's going to continue that way. But, and because it takes so much electricity, we're sort of behind the curve still. And we're not really understanding everything. And because we can't capture the heat as it comes away, because it's so hot, we melt everything. So we went to an electromagnetic system. And now we're learning about how even that a problem. But they're, they're working on it. And I have not worked in fusion. We have some people here today who have. And God bless them. So OK, now let's go on to fission. Fission is the splitting of these radioactive items, uh, atoms, and there's a difference between fizzle and fertile materials. Fizzle is a term to describe isotope that can undergo fission by shooting it with thermal neutrons. Fertile is an isotope that cannot undergo fission with thermal electrons, but when we split U-235, we can make fizzle atoms, and those fizzle atoms are plutonium, U-239 and uranium, and then we can split those and make more energy. So what the idea here is to make the reaction keep going. The more neutrons you shoot into this material, the more they ricochet out and back and forth and hit more and split more, and you get this chain reaction that automatically keeps going because you've reached the threshold. And again, what do we do? We make heat. We release lots of heat to Water. Blow water, make steam, and turn the turbines. Okay, so there's three naturally occurring isotopes, and currently when we do separation, there's only two methods that work, gaseous diffusion and gas centrifuge. We collect this U-235, and we keep adding it up and totaling it up until we get the percentage of enrichment that we want. Now, for years, we did 93%, which is high enriched, and that's also weapons grade. Well, we've decided that it's nice if we, back in several years ago, there was a treaty called the Global Threat Reduction Initiative where everyone agreed, well, not everyone, but most people, most countries agreed that we should go to low enriched so we wouldn't have this nuclear proliferation for weapons grade uranium. And we went down to 19.7%, and that's called low enriched uranium. And currently, the belief in this country for nuclear fuel is to use low enriched uranium and to do a high assay, which just means that it's purified really well. That's all it means. So commercial reactors usually run between 3 and 5% weight percent of uranium, U-235. San Onofre, their fuel is 4.8 weight percent of U-235. Research reactors are 19.7. And those are um, the trigger reactors. A trigger is a, is, a iso is a reactor that makes medical isotopes and is used for research and development. And currently, no one's making that fuel. That fuel is made by a company, or will be made by a company in France, uh, in Romans, by Framatone Circa. And there is a company called Trigger International. It's a joint venture between General Atomics and, and Framatone. And they have the responsibility for bringing this facility up to speed and are going to make trigger fuel. Right now, nobody makes trigger fuel. There's about 36 trigger reactors around the world, and there is no reserve fuel for them. The fuel lasts for a long time, so nobody's hurting for fuel. But we still need to bring this back online. The Department of Energy has ordered something like 776 of these fuel elements that now Ramaz is going to produce. So, and we talked about weapons grade being greater than 93%. That's high enriched uranium. 
The Navy fuel made primarily by BWXT back in Virginia, that's 93.5% enriched uranium also. So the GTRI, the Global Threat Reduction at, uh, Initiative, wanted to reduce the amount of HEU to LEU through primarily starting with the Turner reactors, but also for fuel to, to transfer from high enriched uranium to low enriched. So when U-235 is bombarded with neutrons, the atoms split, we, we get heat, and we get smaller atomic numbers out of the resulting products and elements. So the radiation that gets emitted is in three forms. It's alpha, beta, and gamma. Gamma is the one that penetrates everything. Alpha and beta are larger particles that uh, are stopped by paper or your skin. They don't penetrate. Gamma rays are the ionizing radiation that penetrate through things. So also, on the other end, we can make transuranic elements like plutonium and neptunium. Those are on the other side, higher up uh, for radioactive elements. And those are the ones that we really have a problem with. They have long-lived isotopes. So iodine-129, cesium-137, strontium-99, I'm sure people recognize technetium-99. That is the product that is done for medical, medical testing that we don't make in this country anymore. We, and the Canadians made 40% of our supply, but they're not making it anymore either. Right now we're buying it from Australia. And BWXT claims that they have a method for making it, but it's not licensed yet. So, and they claim they can make it without irradiating U-235 to make uh, radioactive byproducts. So this fuel now is spent nuclear fuel. We have methods for solidifying in glass and ceramics, or we have cast technology that we isolated. Those are the three ways we have of stabilizing this. There are some categories. We have fresh fuels, that nuclear fuel. It's used. It's still good. It's not waste. And then the definition for radioactive waste is materials that we have no longer use for. These are things like uh, the paper goods that, uh, that we use for cleaning things or metals that uh, we're taking a, a rack apart, or parts of the reactor body, the concrete, those things that have contamination on them, those are the things we don't use anymore, and that's what's waste. Fuel is actually usable again. It, it's just used. It's not totally gone. It's, it's not waste. There's still a, at least 90% of the energy available in the fuel that can be used again, put in another reactor and used. It's recyclable. We can reprocess it. We can make different byproducts with it. And the upcoming small modular reactors that are on the forefront of the nuclear technology are going to be using this spent nuclear fuel. There's a number of companies that have designed their reactors to take this fuel that's sitting in all these pools that is a valuable resource and use it to put energy, use it to make energy, to make electricity out of their, their new little reactors. There's several of them. Now, the small modular reactors have a very much advantage because they are, you can make them at the factory. You don't have to build it at a site. You can make them individually. Uh, when you put them at the site, you can transport them on a truck. Most of them are quite small. You can uh, put them together in groups. If you only want one or two, fine. If you want 10, there's a company called New Scale. They, they can put 12 together for you. So you can have as many as you want put in series. And if you have a big city and you need lots of power, put a lot of them together. If you only need a few, if you're a small city, you only need a small amount of electricity, Put one or two. So when you when you make this at the factory, you can use these um, economies of scale production also, where you can make a lot of them with. You can make a lot of them by buying a lot of material and just stamping them out, like you know Ford did with the cars, an assembly line. 
So the, the more you buy, the cheaper it is, to a point. I mean, obviously, economies of scale is not, the, the more you buy, the cheaper, all the way down to zero. It doesn't work that way. There is a price point, and that's how this works also. So they can use, these SMRs can use light water as a coolant, or they can use gas, or liquid metal, or molten salt. And here are three different varieties of light water reactors, the pressure what the pressurized water reactor, or boiling water, and supercritical water reactor. And that's the, that is just the format that they have. The pressurized water uses pressure to build up enough heat to, uh, pr to do the steam. Boiling water does just that. It uses boiling water. So and there are other designs. There, there is what's called the Generation 4 nuclear reactors. They also uh, have the ability to use this new fuel, the, I'm sorry, spent nuclear fuel, and they're cooled with sodium. Or the very high temperature reactor is a graphite moderated, which means the graphite controls the reaction rates of the neutrons, and it's helium cooled. And then there's molten salt. These are all different designs that are going on. There's actually about uh, eight companies that are in the forefront of this. Of course, they all claim that they are the most advanced. And what happens when everybody says they're the best? How do you know who's really the best? It's like when somebody gives you work to do and they say this job is number one, that's number one, that's number one. If you get eight jobs that are number one, how do you know what really is number one? You don't. So now New Scale came out of the University of Oregon. That's where the research started. And they partnered with Ariva, and they are the first company to have their reactor design approved by the Nuclear Regulatory Commission. Now, they are a small light water reactor. Each of their modules is 50 megawatts, and they're the ones who say they have four, eight, 10, 12 put together, or as many as you want. Now, they use water as a coolant and as the neutron moderator. Again, the moderator controls the amount of neutrons that make the reaction go. The more water rate you have, the less the reaction, the slower it goes, and then it stops. When you want to go critical, you put more neutrons in, the, the neutrons shoot it across, they split more atoms, and the more they split, the more neutrons go out and they split more, so now you go critical. So now TerraPower, that's Bill Gates, um, his company claims also to be on the forefront, and they have a molten chloride fast reactor, and they are the ones who have publicized that in 2022, they were going to have a reactor up and running at Idaho National Lab. Well, they didn't quite make it. They're close, but they're not there yet. But again, it's not, it's not approved by the NRC. It is a test reactor. Uh, and then, of course, Canada, that's the stable salt reactor. And they use, they're designed to use spent nuclear fuel. Now, all of these reactors are designed to be passively safe. They don't require people to intervene if they're required to shut down. There's uh, no contained pressure, so everything happens at atmospheric pressure. There's, there's no, nothing to shut off uh, by somebody pushing a button. It's all passive. So the, the temperature, as the temperature rises, the fission reaction slows down because it's self-dampening. Also, oops, what happened? Sorry. Uh, hit the wrong button. Technology's wonderful. Okay, that was deja vu. Okay, these companies also have uh, a small modular reactors. Now, General Atomics just partnered with Framatone, and they're going to make a helium-cooled uh, fast modular reactor. Most of the small modular reactors are, with, are 300 megawatts or less. So, Now, GE Hitachi, they have a boiling water reactor that's um, the BWRX. It's 300 megawatts. So let's recap here the benefits. They can be manufactured under factory conditions, so there are reduced on-site construction costs. You don't have the giant cooling towers. You don't have the containment building. There's a lot of parts that you don't have to have because they're not needed. They're more efficient because they can operate at higher temperatures. The higher the temperature they operate, the more efficient they are. So you don't lose a lot of energy to, to um, environmental heat off to the side. Um, they are contained better, 
they will shut down if something goes wrong, and you don't have to have them by a major water supply. All of the reactors that we see now, San Onofre, Fukushima, a lot of them, they have water for cooling. Well, when you don't use water to cool, you don't have to have it by ocean. And what else goes along with being by ocean that we saw in Japan? <laughs> really? You, you don't have to have, you know, there's no earthquake and no, no tsunami that comes with the earthquake. Do we have earthquakes here? Uh, yeah. <laughs> Nuclear reactors have been traditionally designed to be a safe at a nine on the Richter scale. The new ones are being designed to operate at 12 and still be functional. 12 on, 12 on Richter scale is phenomenal. We've never seen that. Of course, everyone said we never saw nine either. Don't think it's you. I know. So, question? Yeah, can you give us a sense of scale? You talked about these being built in 50 megawatt modules. What does a 50 megawatt module power? Would it power all the Goodwoods Village? Would it power all of Los Angeles? Uh, no, it would, it would power a small city, about 3,000 people. It wouldn't do Los Angeles. You'd need lots of modules together probably 20 to do all of Los Angeles. Was there like 7 million people in Los Angeles, 9 million? The bigger the city, the more you need. So that's the beauty of it. If you don't need a lot, you don't have to have a lot of them. And what happens if you have a lot of them? You have a lot of maintenance, right? You have to keep making sure they're okay and protected, and, but you have to pay for them. If you don't have to pay for them, it, it's cost effective. Question. The question is, are these privately owned companies designing reactors to sell, or are they going to make the power themselves and sell them? They are actually designing the reactors to sell to utility companies, so the utility companies will run them, not the companies that build them. Oh, okay. So I'm being corrected. Don't ask questions till the end. <laughs> Sorry. Okay. Now, all this fuel that is sitting in pools and dry storage around the country, our country is not being very, shall we say, responsible in having a consolidated site for storing this. Now, is that a problem? Yes and no. Yes, we would like to have all of this spent nuclear fuel corralled in one place, but is that really necessary? Not really, as long as it's controlled where it's at. Now, can the facilities use that space for other things after they shut the reactor down? Oh, absolutely, they could. So they would like to transfer it someplace. Since the 1980s, the country, the utilities, have had a lawsuit against the government who has a law on the books that says you will provide a space for consolidating this spent nuclear fuel. And we all know how well the government has responded to that law, right? They haven't. So I want to talk a little bit about the regulatory things in a little bit. But in the meanwhile, this stuff is now stored either in pools of water or in dry storage. Now, the, the way it's stored, it, it's in a safe mode, so it can't do any harm to the environment. Some of it is packaged as, it, as though it can be ready to go for shipping. Now, the Department of Transportation has some very strict rules about how you package and ship radioactive materials, whether it's unradiated or irradiated or waste. They're very, very strict. And so if you don't follow the rules, A, they will fine you, B, they will shut you down, or C, they will take all your license away and you will be out of business. Now, there are companies that specialize in providing casks for radioactive, for irradiated nuclear materials, and there are casks for unirradiated. So depending on what you're shipping, you follow all these rules. 
And the, the manuals are about that thick for the books. There's like two of them, all these rules. And it tells you what size your containers could be and what they'd have to be made out of and how they have to be sealed and what the dose rates are on the surface and what the contamination is. All of those rules have to be followed. Now, so what companies do, utilities have done, is they've stored the material, but not necessarily ready to ship. So before they can ship it anywhere, they're going to have to go through and repackage it. And what they do to repackage is they don't take it out of current package, they just put an overpack on it. So you're not getting exposed. All you're doing is putting another package on the outside that meets the DOT rules. Now, songs, we're going to talk about that in a little bit. There's some guys here that are going to help me out with that. Um, they have plans for how they're going to take care of that. I, I did it again. Oops. Okay, let's back it up because that's better. Okay, we're going to... so they have two systems for, Song has two systems for dry fuel storage. There's a horizontal storage system that from units one, two, and three began in 2003. They have 50 canisters of spent fuel in those canisters. The second system is what they put together for units two and three. And Holtec is the company that built the system there. Now, these containers have a service life of at least 100 years. And NRC has done some analysis of accident scenarios using dry storage systems versus pools of actively cooled water. Because if you didn't cool the water to keep the fuel cool, what happens? What did we see at Fukushima? The, the water got hot, it boiled, it released hydrogen, and the hydrogen is what blew up. That was the problem. Because where were their, where were their backup generators? Underwater. In, uh, in the basement underwater. Does a generator work when it's wet? No. Not so much, right? So, by taking away the water and putting it in dry storage, you now solve this problem of having to keep the water cool. So, the number of events that NRC has determined can happen with storing spent nuclear fuel in dry conditions has gone to zero. They say they, there's nothing that could happen to it. There could be no release of radioactivity. And th it, will, it will just not have accidents as compared to the water. So the spent fuel at, at San Onofre is in airtight, welded steel contain containers that meet stru structural strength and shielding requirements because the radioactivity the gamma rays can still penetrate a lot of materials. And you don't want that, you want to contain that. Now the alpha and the beta, they're stocked by paper, skin, piece of wood. You, know, you don't care about so much about containing those. They're easily contained. It's the gamma rays that you need to control. So reinforced special concrete is used and lead uh, is used to stop the gamma rays. So, and these, Containers have a passive cooling system. There's no moving parts. They're convection cooled. And when they package the fuel, they have put it in helium. And the helium will help with the cooling process. And then there are air vents that circulate around the outside of the container that, again, take the heat away. It's just like a fan on it. Or um, how, what would be in your house? Uh, not really a swamp cooler, but they'll open the window and, and breeze comes in. So this is a picture of, of what a dry cast system would look like, um, just one container. It's not the actual containers at San Onofre, but it, it is made by Holtec. And so it, it's a representative, it's not the exact one. But you can see here the shells, the, the stands, the base plates, and um, all the, the vents that take place uh, that allow the cooling to take place the rings, the lids, and so this is sort of what they look like. I'm not, they're not the exact ones, but I'm sure they wouldn't want me to show you the exact one. But maybe they would, maybe they have a picture. So they go through, periodically examine the exterior of these canisters and the concrete storage modules that they're in. And 
there's what's called an AD management program where they go through and verify that there is no damage to the exterior of these containers. So far, there have been no signs of degradation from in, in, in the canisters, which have been in storage for 17 and 18 years. So we're about one-fifth of the way through the life of a canister. They're not underwater. There's no damage from that. So are we hoping that they might get moved beforehand? Well, yeah, we are. I'm sure the Navy wants that, that area back, but the Navy, the military is not coming forth with another spot on their compound to let this fuel get moved. Now, there's a whole bunch of other issues that it gets moved. There is some public road that's going to have to go on, so DOT is going to get involved. If you're just traveling around on your own site, there's a lot less restrictions about how you move things. But once you hit the public roads, the DOT gets involved. So SONGS has come up with a plan to be ready to move this fuel when they are given permission, if they get permission. So I'm going to ask Manuel if you would like to explain this. Or, sure. yes. yes. You come up here. You're going to make me stand up here all by myself. San Onofre Nuclear Generating Station, owned by SCE, which is Southern California Edison. Thank you. Yeah, so about the uh, strategic plan, right now there uh, is no facility to send the spent nuclear fuel from. <clears throat> the, the San Onofre Nuclear Generating Station, or SONGS, uh, went into decommissioning in 2013. All of the spent fuel at Songs is in, in passive dry storage, uh, weld sealed in canisters. Uh, uh, but the federal government is not holding up to its part. <clears throat> By federal law, the, the um, Department of Energy in particular was to begin picking up spent fuel. Actually, now it's been 25 years. This year is the 25th anniversary of the year 1998 when the uh, Department of Energy was supposed to start picking up spent fuel from sites including uh, Songs. So we developed a strategic plan to see what we could do to accelerate that. And, um, and so the first part is discouraging, 25 years and, and still no solution. Uh, on the positive side, I would tell you that there are some good things happening at present. The Department of Energy is working on a process uh, to do a, a siting process for a facility using consent. So if you learn from the past, uh, the, the current law no, nobody, nobody asked the state of Nevada whether they would like to host the facility. Uh, you might have heard of Yucca Mountain. So that in-law is captured as the one place in the, in the U.S. where you would permanently dispose of spent fuel. But again, nobody asked uh, Nevada for their permission. And what we see internationally is that uh, seeking consent up front uh, is a much more effective process. And that's what's happening in, in Finland, for instance. In Finland, we're in 2023 now, so next year, 2024, Finland will open the first uh, international, the first in, uh, repository of any type in any country. Uh, so that's promising, and that's what the Department of Energy is pursuing now, is a consent-based process for at least interim storage. And then on the, the other thing that's helped, that uh, is encouraging is uh, in, the, in Congress, the um, uh, Senator Joe Manchin is the uh, chair of the Senate Energy and Natural Resources Committee, so it's a committee of jurisdiction that handles these issues, and, uh, and he has circulated at least draft, cir draft legislation that would uh, also uh, help fix uh, policy. So with all that, uh, I would tell you all also, uh, these are long time frames, but the Department of Energy last year now uh, did state that in 10 to 15 years, it would, it would, um, its goal is to have a facility open receiving spent nuclear fuel. They need help from the Senate and, and, the, and the House of Representatives. They need help from Congress in order to fix a few things in uh, legislative terms, but uh, that is certainly their current time frame. Thank you. Thank you. Now we want to be very clear and say that disposal just means storage. We want to be able to get this back so the small nuclear React, the small modular reactors can use this. We don't want to hide it away and never use it. It's too valuable of a resource. 
So right now, for low-level waste disposal, which is again, not fuel, not used fuel, but the auxiliary parts of things that when you take a reactor apart or you decon decommission a facility, flooring, roofing, concrete, anything that got contaminated during the, um, the research process, that stuff that doesn't have any further use, you can't reuse it, you can't recycle it, I mean, you can't throw contaminated things in the recycle bin at Miramar or any of the landfills, right? Not so much. No, 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 bad. So anything that can't be reused is, is really what waste is. Now, the, there are places around the country that do take things like that, but at its low level, it's not the transuranic stuff. It's not really highly radioactive, but... Um, and, Barnwell has a place in South Carolina, but the only people who are allowed to send there are these states, New Jersey, South Carolina, and Connecticut. We have one on the West Coast out here also that is a compact, which is just for Washington, Richland, Washington, which is right up there not far from Hanford, which is another facility, is a DOE facility, that was open to DOE sites to send their uh, radioactive trash. And I personally sent a lot of stuff there when we decommissioned our hot cell. I took our hot cell building and made a puzzle out of it and took it up there and buried it in, in, their, in their trenches. But it was all low-level stuff. And then now this place in Texas, they are um, getting ready to open. And there's another facility that will be a temporary storage designed only to be for 40 years that's also in Texas that will be an interim storage while this long-term storage that the government is supposed to be doing will happen. Now, the, the DOE operates disposal sites for their government waste, which is Hanford, uh, Nevada National Security Site, which used to be Nevada Test Site. Remember where all the hydrogen bombs and the atom bombs were tested out in the desert? That was Nevada Test Site. Well, now it's called Nevada National Security Site, but everyone still calls it NTS, believe me. Now, WIP, the, the Waste Isolation Pilot Plant, this is where military waste goes uh, and for what, from defense stuff, and that's the transuranic waste. Private industry is not allowed to go there, low-level waste is not allowed to go there, and it's called a pilot plant because it's the first of its kind, and they haven't built a second one, they haven't got all, there probably are still some issues with it for accessibility, airflow control, some other things that they're still trying to work out all the details, but that's the only place the military can send their waste. And that is truly waste. This is not stuff they can use over and over again. Okay. So in 2021, the General Accounting Office did a study on commercial spent nuclear fuel, and they came up with four recommendations to Congress about what to do to get off the dime and do something about this, about having some facility where these things, the spent nuclear fuel stored around the country can go while it's awaiting reuse, but clear up these properties so that the, the utilities can use that again. I mean, real estate's valuable, right? People pay a lot of money to have land and to have facilities where they're storing stuff. Storage is actually not really cost effective. The owner of the company that I work for would rather you throw something away than pay for it to be stored because his thing is, if you store it long enough, you definitely exceeded the cost of the item by the storage. And how many of you have storage garages that you rent space in for 100 bucks a month and pretty soon you've paid $3,000 and the stuff you stored in there is worth $300. Uh, so I can understand his, his, his belief, but on the other hand, things like spent nuclear fuel is so valuable that storing it for long periods of time to be used in the future with the small and modular reactors does make sense. But you don't want to squirrel it away where you can't get to it. You don't want to permanently lock it up, because then what do you have to do? You have to make new, right? And is, is making new as cost-effective as using something you already have? Not so much, right? If it's already there, take advantage. So these four things, uh, the recommendations by the GOA to Congress, is authorize this, and, and Manuel talked about this, the consent-based process for this consolidated uh, interim storage and repository facility, and then 
political insulation and continuity of, uh, of leadership for managing this spent uh, fuel disposal program. In this country, we do not have an energy policy separate from whatever group is in power, whether it be Republican, Democrats, whoever. If, if the political party changes, what happens? We flip, right? Whatever that group believes, we do. If, if they don't want nuclear power, we don't have it. If we don't want oil or gas or something, we don't have it because the powers that be say no. But if somebody wants it, what do they do? They fund it. So we need to learn in this country what is best for an energy policy to meet the needs and goals of our country to improve our standard of living, have a consistent supply of, of energy. When oil was first discovered, the oil companies controlled oil at $3 a barrel so the military would have a good long-term supply at a reasonable price. It was controlled until the 70s when who came in? OPEC, right? And they realized that they have a lot of leverage because they, they have the oil. So oil went from $3 a barrel up to, it went over 100 for a while there. So if you have control over an energy supply, you can control a lot of things in a country. And the, the more we demand electricity, the higher our standard of living. If you, don't, if you don't have a good standard of living, you don't need as much energy, right? If you're not gonna drive an electric car, uh, or you're not going to power your house with a refrigerator, or a television, air conditioning, you know, if you're going to live on the farm and have gasoline or uh, kerosene lamps and go to be up the chickens, get up with the chickens, you don't need electricity, right? So if you improve people's living conditions, that's where the demand for electricity has been coming in. And it's not just this country, it's worldwide. When people figured out, oh, uh, the, the better my standard of living, the more comfortable my life, who's not going to get on board? Really? You, uh, I'm going to live in the Ozarks and chop wood and cook on a wood stove. Fun for a while, but everyday life, how many cords of wood it takes to get through a winter? <laughs> it's a lot. Okay, so now the other things here that Congress was recommended to do, the Nuclear Waste Fund, which is really the funds needed, it's not waste, it's really, they call it nuclear waste fund, but it's really the spent nuclear fuel fund to have this permanent storage facility. Now, do you know that right now there is something called a judgment fund that utilities are being paid out of to store their fuel in their own facilities? Because they have to have, they have to have security, they have to have uh, oversight, they have to have monitoring, so there's still costs associated with having this fuel at their facility. And if they're not producing electricity, where's that money going to come from? So the judgment fund is actually a fund set up by the government for recipients of lawsuits where they would win the lawsuit, but they haven't won it yet. The government knows they're going to win. They're, the government knows they're going to lose, so they're going to have to pay this money. So they're paying money out of this judgment fund. And so far they've paid like $9 billion to the various utility companies just so they can keep their fuel stored on their own sites. Is there any, anything in sight that's gonna stop that? Mm, not unless something happens where the Congress does something and tells the DOE to do something. So now Congress is supposed to direct the DOE to develop and implement this integrated waste management strategy they told them, you know, back in the 80s, to make this happen. Congress said to DOE, we saw how well DOEs responded, right? Here we are. So now the GOA, the General Accounting Office, is telling them again. So are we hoping that somebody does something as far as developing a, a, an interim, a site that will take this waste this, I'm sorry, not waste, spent fuel, and store it till we're ready to use it? Yes, because utilities need this space back. I mean, we obviously would like to have this material moved away from the ocean at songs, right? We don't want to see it sit there forever and ever. I mean, it does restrict the use of that beach. It does restrict the military's use of that land. 
So we are in a quandary, and I don't know, a letter writing campaign will probably not help that much. Call your congressman, yeah, right. You know, so um, maybe they'll listen to the general accounting office. I don't know. We'll see. Questions? Questions? Let, let me take one minute, two minutes. This lecture was in a request in response to a film shown at the Concerned Citizens, which was a very alarmist film concerning the storage of spent fuel at San Onofre. They were very concerned that there could be accidents, earthquakes, or other things that would cause this spent fuel to be dispersed and cause great radioactive damage in the area. Now, we've had a very detailed talk. We may have missed the si simple results in these many details. The fact is, yes, there is spent fuel being stored now in maybe 50 reactor sites around the country. And we really should have it do what the government wanted to do, was to take it and put it in one place. But in fact, the spent fuel is not a real danger to any of the locations. It's been around in these reactor sites for 50 years, and there has not been an accident of any significance releasing radioactivity from these sites. And that's the point that I'd like you to take away from this discussion. Thank you, Rob. Another question? Yes. Yes, they're coming. They're coming. Um, thank you. Over right near the podium, where the TV mic Okay. Um, are we importing any spent fuel from any foreign countries? No. Okay. No. And number two, is any of the spent fuel transported on commercial aircraft? No, it's all on it's all on land on on highways. Highways and yes. and, and trains. Um, not high level waste. No, not not spent fuel. Um, radioactive waste, yes. Low level waste. At Songs, they have rail cars, spurs for transporting right. the low level stuff. Not high level. There are some strict rules with sorry with transportation of nuclear materials, spent nuclear fuel. The government only allows a certain amount on the roads within the entire country. So all of the companies, and there's about five, that offer casks and services for putting this, these canisters in their casks and transporting them. They're called Type B casks. And they are highly regulated. They have certificates of conformance. They've done crash tests on them. They have radiological tests on them. And they're all very well controlled and, and very well um, papered, and there's only a certain amount of spent nuclear fuel allowed on the roads at any one time in the entire country, and it's very, it's very worked on. There are an agency where you have to call and make arrangements to get in the queue to transport. Yes, next. Catherine, would all the questioners please come up? Yeah, if you have a question, come up. Just line up. Well, just get in the queue. And my question is, uh, I think I heard that Senator Manchin is the head of the basic committee that deals with the government control of the spent fuel issue. Now, Senator Manson, Manchin is from West Virginia, which is a state that's very tied to coal to generate electricity or uh, power. And I would wonder if possibly Senator Manchin has interests in kind of creating a bureaucracy that makes it difficult to deal with this disposal. Uh, 
the second uh, point, I, I believe, has to do with the storage of uh, the fuel, this uh, recycled fuel, basically. We'd like it to be recycled anyway. And when we talk about uh, our local power system here, and uh, we're talking about convection, convection as a cooling system, which is forced air, basically, I believe. And uh, oh, that's not con that's conduction, which is not forced. Convection is forced air. Well, the, the, the cooling system is passive; it's not forced. It occurs naturally. Well, okay. Well, okay. I'm not. It's not a power. Okay. Well, then I'm not as concerned about that. Yeah. But I am concerned with the political interests, possibly. And I, I, I could, I could see where you know the government is paying the industry. As you said, I think what nine million dollars, nine billion, billion nine billion, yes. and, and that might kind of help slow things down a little if, if you were from West Virginia and were more interested in coal. But just as one point, thank well, you. That, that, I think it's something to think about. You know, with uh, we we've seen Senator Manchin being very active in the last couple of years, and uh, he shows no hesitancy in doing so. Well, maybe somebody should talk to him, too. I don't know who's going to talk to him. Thank you. Thank you. Next. Thank you. Uh, I think one of the problems that people have with uh, nuclear energy in general is that uh, people are scared of it. Uh, it's, they consider it dangerous. And, uh, you know, I look back, and a lot of us in this room are old enough to remember when they used to explode nuclear bombs in the atmosphere. And the government was telling us, don't worry about that strontium-90 in the milk. It's not going to hurt anything. I remember when Three Mile Island blew up. Hey, don't worry about it. Everything's under control. No, it wasn't. Chernobyl, well, that, is that that didn't happen? We don't know if that, you know, the Soviet Union said it never even happened. And Fukushima, they tried to rush to re, you know, not reopen it, but, you know, now they want to put the water, which apparently people have some problems with, and want to release it back into the, into the ocean. Uh, so I don't know if this is an answerable question. Uh, and it just as a comment, too, I was thinking, if uh, Harry Reid hadn't become the majority leader of the Senate, Yucca Mountain would probably be receiving nuclear waste now. Uh, but how do we overcome? I mean, I, I don't see how we, we solve our energy problems without nuclear energy at this point. Uh, so how do we overcome people's fear of nuclear energy? It's like airplane crashes. You know, it may not happen all the time, but when it does, or three or four hundred people die. Nuclear energy, it's kind of the same thing. Might not be a lot of accidents, but when they happen, that's a lot of people who are going to be affected by it. You're right. It's probably not an answerable question at this point, but you're right. When there's an airplane crash, it's severe. And we have not, except for Three Mile Island, we have really not seen the problems like that. Chernobyl was an unfortunate situation where the reactor operators tried to make the reactor do things it was A, not designed to do. They had no test plan for making it do those things and it, things went awry because they were um, mishandling the operating system. Hi, I'm Vicki and I was born in Los Alamos, New Mexico, where the atomic bomb was developed. My parents were atomic weapons workers, and I think we'd be having a very different conversation tonight about this topic in New Mexico, which is basically has become a nuclear colony. So there's Los Alamos Weapons Lab, the Sandia Weapons Lab. I don't think you can disentangle nuclear reactors from our vast nuclear weapons complex, which has been estimated to cost American government $7 trillion to develop all these nuclear weapons and modernize them and maintain them. And it's, uh, it's no secret reactors after World War II came out of that nuclear weapons industry. We basically forced Japan to build nuclear reactors because we could. And so my feeling is that you haven't altogether addressed the immense costs of anything to do with nuclear energy, the uranium mining, which has left New Mexico desolate in many places, uh, infected many Native Americans through the poisoning of the waters and the lands. There's just a lot of uh, uh, 
the weapon cycles, the cost of these canisters and trying to find a place to store them. No, uh, no company will insure any nuclear reactor. That's my understanding. We, the taxpayers, assume the liability for all the nuclear reactors in the United States. And I feel like if the United States is to lead in improved energy resource usage, we can't be wishing small water reactors on India, Bangladesh, Pakistan. The, whole, the world can't follow this model. We can't expect standards of safety across the world. So I just want to react as, uh, as someone who my entire life has been involved with this nuclear industry. My parents died early of radiation-related cancers. Uh, it's, a, it's a big, big problem. And I, have, I just personally want to say I think the nuclear weapons industry has driven this side industry of nuclear reactors. And it's not commercially viable. It's not financially viable. The costs are enormous. And I feel like you haven't really quantified what's a megawatt for cost, really cost, life cycle, from a nuclear reactor versus solar versus wind versus other solutions that I feel obviously we should be pursuing renewables, not dangerous uh, radioactive, uh, these radioactive waste and spent fuel situations. But I appreciate your talk. Thank you. Thank you. And she's right. I did not bring any financial information to show what is the cost both dollar-wise and human life-wise and environmental-wise with this nuclear energy. I didn't bring any of that information with me, but there are people who study it, and you can go look for it, and it's publicly available, but uh, it does have a cost. Everything has a cost. Electricity has a cost, and are we willing to do that? That is the choice that society has to make. And like I said, I, I didn't bring that financial information.